come as those who are needing and needy of your grace. So we praise you for it. We thank you for it. And we thank you for all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, uh, we spoke from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which uh, was, for I decided to know nothing among you except, there's an except in there, except uh, Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And we spoke about some reasons why we should embrace the cross, why we should see the goodness of God in the cross of Christ, why we should wrap our arms around it and delight in all that God has given us in the gospel through the cross. Today, we are looking at a different passage uh, that also has an accept in it. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to look at reasons for uh, the glory of the cross, because it's one thing for us to see the value of the cross and to embrace it. It's quite another for us to be totally captivated by it. And of course, that's what the passage is speaking about. So we want to look at three reasons why we ought to be boasting in the cross of Jesus Christ. But it is Father's Day, and so uh, I'm one of those who believes that fathers should be spoiled on Father's Day. In fact, spoiled rotten. Um, Why, thank you, sir. I must need this. Thank you. It is a day for us to boast about good old dad, and we ought to do it. That's exactly what three little boys did one day. They were at the schoolyard. They were all bragging about their fathers. And the first boy says, my dad scribbles a few words of, uh, on a piece of paper. He calls it a poem, and they give him 50 bucks for doing it. Second boy says, eh, that's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a song, and they give him $100. The third boy says, I've got you both beat. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a sermon, and it takes eight people to collect all the money. (laughs) (laughs) Well, all of us have something that we boast about, accomplishments, groups that you and I belong to, our own brazen self-righteousness at times reminding ourselves of just how good we are. But Galatians 6 verse 14 asks a reasonable question. And the question is simply this, why shouldn't I boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? Give me any reason why I shouldn't do that. And we're going to look at three reasons why we actually should. And the first reason is this, the cross is worthy of ultimate, uh, ultimate boasting. Far be it from me, says the Apostle Paul, to boast in anything actually except in the cross. It re, uh, begins with a retort. It's one of those reactions uh, that suggests that there's something very ludicrous that's taking place. All of us have done this in our lives. Uh, we come up to a choice. A decision has to be made. One of those choices is really good, and the other one is really bad. And so, in our hearts at least, we react by saying, Dude, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be crazy. I wouldn't even consider anything else. That's exactly what verse 14 is saying to us. I remember back in the 70s, we uh, bought a little MGB. Now, for those of you who aren't into that kind of thing, it's a little British racing car, sports car. It was very fun. It was also a pain in the neck because no matter what you did, the thing never ran right. You were always adjusting the carburetors. You were always fixing the points and the plugs and, and all of that. It was just a nuisance. And finally, Julie and I decided we needed the money, and so we put it out on the corner to be sold. And some guy came up to me and said, well, I'll give you 400 bucks for it. I'm like, dude, are you crazy? That's what's going on here at the beginning of our verse. Paul is reacting to the Judaizers around Galatian who uh, think that reverting back to the works of the law is a good idea and it's a good way to please God. Judaizers were just religious folks who mixed 
the cross of Christ with all different kinds of mosaic regulations and laws. And if you study history, it actually was a pretty good idea, at least early on, the mosaic law, because it was based on the Old Testament. But by the time Jesus came, it wasn't worth much at all. And so the Judaizers, like you and I, had two problems. And the first problem is that no one can ever please God by human effort. No one, ever. I hope that you're not trusting in that. Uh, Tell me that you're not really thinking that somehow you're okay with God because you're such a nice guy. And because you try so hard to please him, there is no way to please God in that way. Romans chapter 3 reminds us that there's no one who's ever going to be justified that way. Certainly not by the law. So that was one problem. The other problem was that something, or rather someone, had come on the scene who was much better than the law. And that person was Jesus, the crucified God. And so why should we boast in the cross? Well, because sin had separated and has separated us from the living God. It has separated what is holy from that which is profane. It has separated the life of God uh, with the eventual death of everything else in creation. It has separated righteousness from the sin that so easily besets us. It has separated the promise of God from the hopelessness of our own human effort. And so the cross alone restores this awful breach, this infinite divide between God and human beings. It's eliminated. It's removed. It's bridged through the cross. Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, now you are no longer far off. You are near by the blood of Christ. He reconciled us to God through the cross. We're just saying that there is nothing in the universe like the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so why boast in the cross? Well, it's simple because There's nothing else. This world is 10 million times better off because Jesus Christ endured the cross. Why does it begin with this incredulity? God forbid, I can't believe you would boast in anything else. Because by nature, you and I will boast in anything and everything else other than the cross. It's the only option that really matters in the sight of God. And so it is something we ought to do. Think about it. Throughout history, people have always wrestled with, um, with God. Uh, the problem always being lack of belief, not lack of effort. All of us, in some way or other, are trying to please and honor God. But John chapter 3 reminds us, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed. And so the cross is something that is distinctly different. It doesn't make for good conversation at dinner time. I get that, to talk about the cross. But we do live in a world that's saturated by sin and death and the curse. And no matter what we do, it's obvious that we have a problem. For example, after years of self-improvement, I've been at it for many years now, I'm still kind of a nasty guy inside, and so are you or girl. A lifetime of good intentions. We still live in this world of of hurt and centuries of government solutions. And apparently we're worse than we've ever been if you listen to the news. So we do live in this world of trouble. So in the first century, they had the same problem because the Judaizers sought to please God, but not successfully. So they would work at all of these works of the law. For example, be circumcised or be a Sabbath keeper or be Jewish, even if you weren't Jewish and they weren't successful. In America, we're far worse than that. We don't think that we have a problem at all. In fact, we think that God sits up in heaven quite enamored with all of us simply because we're good old guys living in America. We're like Alfred E. Newman from the old Mad Magazine, maybe you remember that. We embody unbelief. We sit there and we're like, what? Me worry? (laughs) When it comes to eternity? The retort, therefore, in verse 16 is very reasonable. There's no other solution except the cross. What the Judaizers proposed did not work. What centuries of human effort sought to accomplish has not worked. What America is trying to do will not work because the problem really isn't out there. 
The problem is in here, and nothing can resolve that except for the cross. But as for me, Paul is saying, are you crazy? There is another thing that makes the cross worthy of ultimate boasting. And we don't often think about this, but we really should. The problem with sin or death and the curse is not only one of degree. It is. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. It is not enough for us to say, if I just live a little better, if I just try a little harder, then God can accept me. Now, that's part of it. But there's a bigger problem. It's not only a problem of degree. It's also one of location. That's a problem of location, because either I am part of this world that is condemned and is dying and is corrupt and is passing away, or I'm part of another kingdom, the kingdom that is rescued or brought me into it through the cross, made right through the mercy of God and restored by grace. So the problem is not just lack of effort. We need to remember that always. It is lack of belief. The cross does not say try harder. The cross says, believe. This word is near you, Romans 10. The word of faith that we proclaim that if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, something will happen. And what will happen is you will be saved. You will be relocated. We learn about that in Colossians chapter 1. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We're just saying that there's nothing else in the world like the cross. There's nothing in the universe that can do that for us. Only Jesus Christ can rescue us from sin and death and then in its place move us into the kingdom of the beloved son. So the first reason that I should boast in the cross is it really is worthy of ultimate boasting and nothing else is. The cross is. The second reason why I should boast in the cross, number two, the cross is worthy of unrivaled glory. Far be it from me, or may it never be, Paul says, to boast that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you already know that in the first century, there were many, many crosses, not just one, not just three but many crosses. In fact, uh, historians guess that there were at least tens of thousands of people who died on a cross, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who died that way. In 71 BC, 6,000 people were crucified in one day. So we're not suggesting that there's anything at all that's praiseworthy or glorious about that form of capital punishment. We're just saying that there were no hymns written about the old rugged cross in the first century. And so if you were having dinner together or you were meeting together, the last thing that you would want to talk about was a cross. We're not here to glory in that grim spectacle uh, that the Romans delighted in. But there is one huge distinction about the cross on which Jesus Christ died. And Isaac Watts nailed it in his hymn when he said this, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. And that's the distinction. The only thing wondrous about the cross is the one who died on that cross for you and for me. The focus of the cross is on one person. Christ Jesus. The power of the cross resides in the one who gave himself for us. The wisdom of the cross centers on the God-man who upended death and sin and hell and the curse forever. Of course, we're speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross is wondrous because and only because of the one who willingly gave himself for us. The lover of our souls, the Lord of glory, the Prince of heaven, the crucified God, the worthy one, the one before whom every knee will bow, the one before whom every tongue will confess, that's what makes the cross glorious. And in that, in him, we rejoice. One of the reasons why the cross is so worthy and is so glorious and is so worthy of boasting is because it's not about you (laughs) and it's not about me. And it's not about some other religious figure or some politician who's promising a utopia if we'll just buy into what they're bringing to us. 
The reason that the cross is so wondrous, because on the, on the cross, the prince of glory died, and in him we rejoice. The cross really is worthy of unrivaled glory. We should proclaim it. We shouldn't be afraid to say it. I'll admit it. Since I was just a teenager, it's really hard to do. I remember when I first was saved, I was in seventh grade and I would go to church or go to school rather and uh, would bring up the gospel, bring up the cross. And I can tell you what, I was anathema all of a sudden. I wasn't one of their friends anymore. I was different. Of course I was different. I had been brought into a new kingdom. We need to proclaim it anyway. Heaven proclaims it. Worthy are you, Lord Jesus Christ, for you were slain, and with your blood you ransomed people for God. We're proclaiming the cross of Christ simply because of the one who was on that cross. The world could never have imagined anything like what took place on the cross, but we know, and so we respond. Has anyone else in history ever done anything like the Lord Jesus did for us? The answer is no. No one else. Have you ever been in debt? I mean, nasty debt. One of those indebtedness that that just kind of takes your breath away and keeps you awake at night, where you're just wondering, how, how will I ever pay this off? Debt. The Bible says that being in debt is like being in prison. It's like being in bondage. The borrower, uh, Proverbs 23, is slave to the lender. It's true of money. Like We, we already get that. <clears throat> we owe somebody something, money, for whatever reason. And every time we see that person, whether they say it or not, we think they're saying, hey, when are you going to pay me back? All right, because we owe them something. I'm glad that uh, when we take out a mortgage, we don't take it out from our friends. We take it out from the bank because that's a thing. It's not a person. But we still know that we owe the money. But it's true of money. It's also true relationally. I mean, we do this to each other, right? If you don't satisfy my demand, then then I'm going to make you pay because you owe me something. Of course, there are relationships. You you feel like you can never pay it back. And, And we're in bondage in that way. But it's certainly true redemptively because we are in immense debt to God. We spoke about that, sang about that earlier today. That we have a debt we could not pay. We do have a debt before God that we can not pay. There is no one righteous. And so God has every right to say, you owe me. And he's absolutely correct in it. Well, it's one thing to be in debt to God to be in bondage. Romans chapter 3, all of sin that falls short of the glory of God. We can live with that. I'm so glad the passage doesn't end there. It ends by saying, and are justified freely as a gift of his grace. It's another thing to be hopelessly in debt to God. And that's the thing that we don't want to consider, that we bring nothing to the table, that we have nothing to offer. We can't even give them a little tiny pittance against what we owe. Romans chapter 3, listen to the negations in this verse. They're so strong. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. To which I say, ouch, (laughs) that hurts. I'd like to think that I could bring something to the table, but we cannot. Those who recognize this horrible fact have one recourse and only one recourse, and that is the cross. Because if I believe that I have even a little smidgen of righteousness, then all of a sudden I protest and I suggest that I really don't need the cross. You know, it is a nice offer, but I'll just take care of it myself. Thank you very much. That's the human heart. The cross dispels all of that nonsense. Someone sent me uh, this, wor- this week uh, an email, which is a misinterpretation of John 14. I think it's from the Babylon Bee. I don't watch, I don't see that, but I, that's what I think. Here it is, John 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Buddha, 
Vishnu, Muhammad, or just being a good person, spiritual, but not too religious. That's cool with me too. Of course, that's not what the Bible teaches. Far be it from me. We get the idea, far be it from me, that uh, we should boast in anything except the cross. And this is where the glory of the cross comes in. It's a divine accomplishment. It has nothing to do with what you and I do. Rather, it exposes me. I'm not, no one's righteous. And it also rescues me. What the flesh was unable to do, God did. So take a Bible and search through it and see if you discover anywhere in there a cooperative effort between you and God. You will not find it. I'll do your part, Lord. You do do yours, I'll do mine. It's not in there because there's never been anything like the cross. It is the only solution, the only satisfaction that's ever been accepted by God. So why should I boast in the cross? (laughs) What else would I boast in? There's nothing else. It is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. So when it comes to the cross... And to the glory of the cross, there's a necessary question that needs to be answered. And the question is simply this, what did the cross do that I can never do? What is it about the cross that is totally unlike anything I can ever bring to it? And there are three answers. The first answer is that Jesus judged sin on the cross. It's Colossians chapter 2, as, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, but God made you alive. In other words, he set our sin aside, nailing it to the cross. We already know that. What we don't remember is that our sin was so vile that God had not only the right, but the obligation to condemn us forever because of it. (laughs) So out of my soul, says far be it from me to boast in anything else except the cross, because sin was dealt with there. Death was also dealt there. Let me be a little bit blithe as we talk about death for a minute, add a little bit of satire, because you go to a memorial service and you hear the most ridiculous things. It always amuses me when, when I hear these things that are said at a memorial service. For example, we go to the service and we hear this. Doesn't Uncle Melvin look restful? And I'm like, no, he looks dead to me. <laughs> the truth is that death is an enemy. It is not our friend in any way at all. But it's not just an event. Well, we live 70 years and we die. And it's not just a series of events. Well, you know, did you realize that every year your body replaces every cell, your whole body weight? It's like, hey, where'd all this come from? I'd like to know. But every year, I guess there are more cells the second year after the first year. But, but every year our body replenishes, but it doesn't, it's not able to keep up. And so after 70 or 80 years, we die. So maybe it's an event. Maybe it's an event that takes 70 years to accomplish, but it's more than an event. And this is what matters. It's a relocation. It's a relocation for you and for me. I mean, it's one thing to acknowledge that that death takes everything that we love, everything that we love, and it takes it away from us. But it doesn't do that only. It also takes us. It takes us somewhere else. And so Hebrews chapter 9, it's appointed unto man once to die, and, and then the judgment. We're talking about relocation. I can tell you what. Only the cross fixes that. And so we ought to be saying, hallelujah, far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So sin is dealt with, death is dealt with, and the curse is also dealt with. The third thing, pain in childbirth, and then pain after childbirth (laughs) for for many, right? Um, Work and toil and constant sweat and loss. Marriage aggravation that never ends. The curse crushes the life out of us. Let, uh, no more let sins and sorrows grow. I love that carol. Nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessing known far as the curse is found. And I want to say hallelujah for that. I get tired of sin. I don't like death. And I'm weary of the curse. It just wearies me. One of the old Disney Westerns is a movie called Support Your Local Sheriff. I don't recommend it. 
And I don't recommend it because it probably has some junk in it. <laughs> just, just anything that comes from Hollywood probably has something in it that I don't want to recommend. So I'll just recommend the YouTube clip that I saw. And that's all. But the movie is uh, this guy, James Garner, is a rather underwhelming guy who uh, comes into town and he's appointed sheriff in this small town. And everybody expects him to fail. And everybody lets him know that they expect him to fail. And all around him is just this sense of unbelief. But one guy in particular, one of the moronic sons of the Danby family, just gets under your skin as you listen to him talk and talk and talk. And he never seems to stop. And so Joe Danby, the worthless son, says mockingly to James Garner, the sheriff, he says, I hear you're going to try to arrest me. You don't know, or uh, yeah, you, you know you don't look near as tough as those other sheriffs we've had lately, particularly that old boy that done run off about an hour and a half after he took the job. And Garner looks at him with some derision, and he says, Joe, you just make me feel tired all over when you talk like that. That's what sin and death and the curse does. It just makes us feel tired all over. It makes my soul feel weary. It makes my soul feel, feel tired. And it makes me want to say hallelujah. Far be it from me to boast in anything except the cross of Christ Jesus our Lord. Of course, there is more. It's an amazing theology. We read about it in verse 15, which we won't go into today. But verse 15 really is the result of verse 14, which is this, an entirely new creation. And it isn't just speaking about the global, the universal uh, redemption, the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. It's speaking specifically about a recreation that takes part, place in the heart of every single believer who ever lives. You and me. It says this, far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Why? Because we're part of something that is entirely new and entirely unimaginable. It is in verse 15, a new creation. And so we're not just talking about the recreation of the universe. In every single individual Christian, God is doing a work of transforming them, of moving them from death to life. Paul is not the only one who ought to be saying, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You and I should be saying, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. All because of the cross. The old is gone, the new has come. We have every reason to boast in the cross. Why shouldn't I boast in the cross? Three reasons why I should. Number one, it is worthy of ultimate boasting. It's ludicrous to boast in anything else. Number two, the cross is worthy of unrivaled glory. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ because nothing else works. There's nothing else like the cross. There's nothing or no one else like Christ Jesus who is so worthy of our boasting. But there's a third reason, and it is this. The cross is worthy of unchallenged loyalty. Unchallenged loyalty. And here's where Paul says, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The third reason that I should boast in the cross is this bold distinction between two worlds. We don't live in that old world. Well, we do, but we don't belong to that old world anymore. And little by little, we're being moved out of that world. And one day we will ultimately be uh, moved out of that world. And so the cross rips me out of one world and places me securely in another. It tears me out of the world of sin and death and the curse, but it does more than that. It reorients me because God has placed me in a brand new kingdom so it is, we ought to rejoice in the cross. This is a massive divide, a huge divide. The world, the world that's dying has, has been crucified to me. And I have been crucified to the world. I am not part of this anymore. Sin and death is not part of my ultimate experience. Let me give you an, an illustration. I don't know how good it is of an illustration it is, but it's the only one that I could come up with. So here we go. If it's good, you can say, oh, that was a great illustration. And if it stinks, you can say, that was an ever, whatever you want to do. So here we go. Imagine that you're living in the first century 
and you're a galley slave on a warship somewhere. And uh, <clears throat> you have no say in what takes place. You're captive. Morning, noon, and night, you're chained to the rower's bench, along with uh, some other unsavory characters. And uh, you're, you, you eat whatever it is that you're given. And when you need to go to the bathroom, you don't need to move because the bathroom is down at your feet. And that's your life. And that's where you live. You're a galley slave. No mercy, no recourse, and no hope. But then one day, you're liberated. And you're very glad about that. You're very happy that you don't have to be in the galley ship any longer. But there's more. The guy who liberated you is your brother. And so now, all of a sudden, you're, you're lifted up out of that mess. You're placed in a new station. You're given standing in the family. You belong there. You're a person of privilege, loaded, in fact. Do you ever want to go back to that old galley, galley ship? The answer is no. Wouldn't you say that's ludicrous? That's crazy. Well, you and I boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ for that exact reason. There is nothing else anywhere in this world like it. There is no one else anywhere in the universe like the Lord Jesus. This is the message of the cross. And it's the message of the gospel. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Why shouldn't I boast in the cross? Why not? Why shouldn't I boast in the cross? Well, we're given three reasons why we should. Number one's the retort. It is worthy of ultimate blessing. It's lunacy to boast in anything else. Number two, the reason or the rationale, it's worthy of unrivaled glory. No one else has done anything like what Jesus Christ has done. The third reason is the result. It's worthy of unchallenged loyalty because I've been crucified to this world. I don't really care what this world thinks anymore. I do care about what's going to take place in that world where I'm headed. So why wouldn't I boast in the cross? of Christ. I don't have any obligation anymore to this world. Boy, if we would get that, our life would be so different. That life has been crucified. I'm a new creation and something in us should say, I should be almost giddy about this great news of the cross. And of course we are. Well, the only question left to ask is simply this, why does it matter? And my answer is, are you crazy? <laughs> why does it matter? We saw why it matters. The cross of Jesus Christ matters because there's nothing like it. There is no one like him. For the Judaizers, it mattered a great deal because their boast was all about them. All about how righteous they were. To win the praise of other people. This big outward show. And we're tempted to that at times too. But in America, it matters because we have an additional risk that's looming. And that, uh, that uh, risk is simply this. We face the risk of silence. Number one, because of the fear of reproach. And we are getting it in our day. Everybody is an intelligent, thoughtful person, except those Bible believers. It is coming. It's here already. And so that, that fear of reproach and derision will, will, will cause us to be quiet. We can't do it. And the second reason is the fear of being canceled and silenced by others. And we can't let that happen either. It can never happen, ever. Well, I suppose there are a million things to boast about, whether it's a son boasting about his father or a thousand other things. But there is nothing more worthy of our boast than the cross because of the cross, we have every reason to boast in the Lord Jesus Christ. If the whole world wants to laugh, let it laugh. But as for me and you, far be it from us to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Let's bow, shall we, as we pray. Father, we thank you for the magnificence of the cross. We confess that we, we have heard this so many times that we, we tend to become numb to it. And there are times when we, we don't recognize and respond to the, the greatness of who you are. Help us, we pray. 
We would be those who would be bold and courageous in our generation. That we would be a people who are known because of the cross and known because of the, of the Christ of the cross. So let that be our portion, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name.